So when I was growing up on a farm in Alberta, I knew about Tanglewood. When I came here the first time, I just overwhelmed by it. The first time I set foot on the grounds and that feeling has never wavered. There's somebody here practicing piano. There's somebody over there warming up on trumpet. It's a definite musical utopian environment out here. This is actually my first Tanglewood season in the role of assistant conductor. It is a pleasure to be part of it. You know, I, I hopefully I never take that for granted that I get to play with so many talented people. What a thrill. It's just a fun job. It's, it's, it's fun to be around the people, especially with our new conductor. That's really fun. What makes the Boston Symphony absolutely unique in the world of orchestras is Tanglewood. Opening night at Tanglewood was incredible. The most fun I've had at an opening night concert probably since I started here in 2010. This kind of Americana opening night, we did Gershwin's Concerto in F. and we played this just classic Copeland Lincoln portrait, which is purely orchestral in nature. It's lyrical, it's beautiful. It requires a lot of blend and balance. And then literally right after that, we played uh, Ellington's Harlem. I was so inspired afterwards. I was just I was so on such a high I couldn't go to sleep for two or three hours after just to to hear the lyricism of the Copeland compared to that searing jazz quality that this orchestra can play with in the Harlem was cool, and the, and the audience really responded to it well. What's it like to play in the Boston Symphony? Do you know what it's like? It's like getting in a Ferrari and it's all taken care of. Everything's, you know, in the right place. It's got all the bells and whistles. It works. It's great. And it's probably a red one too, I bet. I like red ones. When I'm teaching the Tanglewood Fellows here, my first couple of summers when I would do a master class, I think I was far more daunted to teach those classes with those players than they were to play for me. Maybe to speak technically, the way I arch my tongue helps a lot. That's like, it's like way up there. When I play very relaxed, my air support just sort of gives out, you know, I'm just, you know, and then not moving the air through. The playing that we still hear here every summer is just tremendous. What these, I call them kids, but they're, what these young adults are able to do on their instruments, the level never drops. It, they could sit in with us uh, in the BSO trumpet section and almost without exception, just step right up and, and hit one out of the park and, and we'd be totally comfortable. Well, that's how good these players are.
I grew up on a pig farm in rural Alberta, 13 kilometers north of Edmonton, which is the capital of Alberta. We had a thousand pigs and a thousand acres that we farmed every year. My parents did Canadian Opera Company for a little while. That's sort of how they met. My mom was the first Madame Butterfly in Edmonton. My older sister picked the flute. My younger brother plays French horn, so we're sort of three-fifths of a woodwind quintet. Last weekend, we did the Dvorak Serenade for, as a prelude. Those are concerts that happen at Ozawa Hall, and they happen at 6 o'clock. That was great, because you tend to work with colleagues you haven't worked intimately with. You know, string players, I sit sort of next to them, yet you don't actually make really chamber music with them. So it's a lot more fun. I picked up the bassoon when I was 13. There was a cute boy in the band that played trumpet, so I thought I'll play trumpet. And I went up to the trumpet professor at the University of Alberta and I said, could I study trumpet with you? And he said, you know, you look like a bassoon player. And I didn't A, know what a bassoon was, and I didn't know what a bassoon player looked like. My first lesson on the bassoon was how to put it together, and I fell in love with it from the instant I touched it. It was just so cool. I graduated grade 12, and the Montreal Symphony came to Edmonton to play a concert, and they played Mahler One, oh, which is, you know, where the horns stand up at the end. I mean, I remember just going, oh, thinking that's like rock and roll. That was so cool. And Montreal Symphony, Charles Dutois was the conductor, and it was just one of the best orchestra concerts I'd ever heard, and I thought, I'm going to McGill. There was an audition for second bassoon in the Montreal Symphony, and luckily won that job. She was very young. I think it was probably one of her, her first, um, you know, position in the business. Best orchestra I had ever played with. It was wonderful. We loved her. It was like my dream job. I'm never leaving him. I think she was quite fortunate to, to come there because there was, it's an orchestra which had a school of playing, intonation, ensemble playing, colors. I wanted to see if I could get a job in the States. Boston Symphony came open. Luckily, I was a match for who they were looking for. And of course, I was very sad when she left, although she came to Boston and for me it's a treat because I come here all the time so I can see her. This is something that audiences at Tanglewood I don't think have ever seen before and something they're going to be blown away by. So the concert will be divided into thirds. The first third will be the Boston Pops Brass playing some staples of the brass ensemble literature. Some Copeland, some Shostakovich. Uh, we'll end our third with an arrangement of festive overture. The middle portion of the concert will be two drum and bugle corps. One from the Boston area, the Boston Crusaders, as well as the Blue Devils from Concord, California. The Brass Spectacular at Tanglewood was unlike anything the BSO or the Boston Pops have ever done. To be a part of it was really amazing. Alice, nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. We knew that the, the drum corps coming in were going to put on a great show. No, no, orange in the middle. But we weren't sure how well attended it would be or how well received it was going to be. Tristan, you're going to assist me on the Gabrielli. Good to see you. Thanks for, thanks for playing, man. Yeah, of course. So one of the great things about drum corps is the character that is built when you're a performing member of one of these organizations. You have a job to do every single day. And if you don't, then the drum corps doesn't get down the road that day.
The rehearsal started with the Pops brass section, and of course, they sounded phenomenal. But the most exciting thing for me, the thing I was looking forward to the most, was for my dad to step on the podium and conduct the Pops with me playing in it. I'm just so proud of Michael because he's the one who had this dream. He spoke to the orchestra about bringing in the drum corps students to play. Are you ready to be introduced? Awesome. Everyone, thanks again. This is my father, Freddie Martin. Freddie Martin is honestly an institution in his own right. He's worked with drum corps for decades and he's a really well-known band director. Dad and I have done a lot of performances together where he'll conduct and I'll play a solo, or I've played with his groups down in Atlanta before. But it was a new experience for us to share the stage together as conductors, but particularly you know, with the Boston Pops. I know it meant a lot to him, but it was something for me that was just really special. For Chris, my brother and I, to be where we are, I think it's safe to say we wouldn't be here without him. I think this is kind of a reward for him for all of the decades that he has given to educating young brass players and young musicians in general. I want to take you on a little tour of my bassoon. Four pieces. Every joint has a name. This is called the boot joint. I do not know why. This is the wing joint. So there's the wing. Um, quite often in the old days, you'd be playing and all of a sudden you'd go da 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 and this horrible sound will come out of your bassoon. That's because usually water gets in one of the holes. It doesn't happen very often to me. I'm lucky. This is the long joint, and it is called the long joint because in the old days it used to be the longest joint, but at some point they wanted to make every joint the same length. This is the bell. But now if you look, like all four joints are the same length, which is kind of nice because it fits into a smaller case. And now because airlines are so sticky, it is called the gentleman's cut. Because um, gentlemen carry smaller case, I don't know. The bassoon is the only instrument, like piano, that uses all ten fingers. So if you look, I cover these holes. Pinky has got two. Thumb's got nine. Very busy thumb. And then the right hand, one, two, three. Pinky, three. You know, we're very, I have very strong pinky muscles. This is a vocal, and it is the first entryway into the bassoon. It's also slightly a tuner. If you push it in, you're higher. If you pull it out, you're lower. The weather is so varying that when it gets hot, this goes sharp. When it's cold, this goes flat. So next, I should have started this earlier, but we soak reeds. This is my reed case. Uh, here's a good one. I like it to be all wet all the way through. First notes of the day. bassoon will never be a princess, will never be a fairy or a beautiful woman. It's going to play the fat person, the lazy person, the drunk person, the ugly person, um, the slow person. And it does it really well. It's got this sort of bouncy, boopy, you know, kind of comical sound. You just, and I love it. I, I wouldn't want to play the princess. After we finished the Pops portion of the rehearsal, we had to bring in all of the players from both drum corps, the Blue Devils and the Boston Crusaders. Slowly as we figure out what we're doing, the first baritones around, we'll keep you guys together. That in itself was probably the most challenging part of the day because we weren't 100% sure that every single player from all three groups was going to fit on the stage at once. Where's this one going? I don't know. Crusaders and Blue thank you all for being here. My name is Michael Martin. I'm in the trumpet section of the Boston Symphony. The Boston Pops brass is behind you. Boston Pops, could you guys wave? Funny wave.
This week, Cindy Myers, Rachel Shilders, and I did a kitty concert through what is called Tanglewood for Kids. Probably been five years now we've done them, and I love them. I love them. Generally, there's a couple hundred children that come in and they sit really close. It was actually, a, it's called the Nelson Trio. My last name is Nelson. And it was written for my family. I have three siblings, or I have two siblings, but there's three of us. My older sister plays flute. I play bassoon, the middle child. And my younger brother plays horn. And we had a piece written for us 25 years ago. And, um, but it's a really nice piece. And I wanted to sort of make a group and play it at Tanglewood because I felt it was worthy of Tanglewood for kids. So I hope you like it. The kids are generally quite young. They asked some of the best questions, you know, um, what's your bassoon's name I got? Kid concerts are so important, almost as important as our regular symphony season because it introduces children to the wonderful world of music and what it can do to their hearts, their lives, their adult life too. They're unpredictable. The kids generally love them. As long as they get to sing, they love to sing, they love to dance. What I really enjoy about these kiddies concerts is that you can't predict what's going to happen. There was this boy that was so enthralled with Cindy's flute. First he would stare at the flute and then he just had to touch it. When Showtime rolled around and I saw how many people were in the audience, it all hit home pretty hard and I got so excited because the turnout was immense. Way more people than we ever thought were going to come for a first time event that's so different and so unique. Gentlemen, ladies, have a great one. Let's go. Standing on the podium in my white jacket, conducting the Boston Pops brass section was a surreal experience and it was immensely exciting. But the most special part of the evening was hearing my dad's name announced. Freddie is a high school band director. We were talking backstage. It's hard to believe he is going on 45 years in teaching this year. One of the nice guys in the activity, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Freddie Martin, to conduct the performance. I've seen so many brilliant conductors and musicians come on that stage and take the podium, you know, the same podium that now my dad is getting on and conducting. What we learned from dad growing up, 
I still use those lessons every day, even though he always calls himself just an old band director. He doesn't even understand the world that we're in in terms of playing. He'll say that a lot. I have to remind him constantly that I still use the techniques that he taught me. The way I practice, the way I perform are all things I learned from him. For me to be able to give that back to him and him to just be able to come in and conduct the Boston Pops and just enjoy it. I was happy and proud of the entire event, if only to be able to give that to my dad. We had the, the Boston Pops on the back row of the risers and the rest of the Crusaders and, and Blue Devils horn lines in front of them. It was shoulder to shoulder. Everyone was <laughs> on top of each other. So without further ado, Maestro, you ready? Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. I couldn't think of a better way to send off a big brass extravaganza concert at Tanglewood than 1812. Uh, you wouldn't really expect 1812 to be performed with only brass players and about 200 of them. Doing the arrangement was really fun to get to kind of combine two worlds that I love. With the Boston Pops being able to put a lot of virtuosic uh, moments from the string and wind parts in the original Tchaikovsky, and then allowing the, the Blue Devils horn line and the Boston Crusaders horn line to, to really kind of revel in the, the power of that piece and the bigger brass chorale moments. It was, it was a lot of fun, you know, because it's like we play the violin parts, you know, we play the woodwind parts, basically, you know, we play all these really active, melodic, virtuosic parts that, you know, we get some of that in the orchestra, but not a lot, and certainly not as much as we did in that concert. They were great, just their attitude, I like what it stands for. I really like the culture. I like really what it does for those kids. I mean, they work really hard and they sound spectacular. They sound really great. sound is a perfect marriage, I think, of, of the two worlds, of the professional brass player and the, the highly talented drum corps brass players to be able to show off what they do so well.
this is probably the loudest thing that anyone has ever heard uh, in the shed, at least from a from an acoustical standpoint. We were all just honestly blowing our brains out in a musical way. I think it was the loudest I've ever played, bar none. I, mean, I, was, I was hitting the drums as hard as I could without breaking the heads. Ken David has a big job, actually. He has got to be ready to step in at a moment's notice. See, you notice the young guy is pushing. The old guy is carrying. The young guy's smarter. <laughs> <laughs> Funding for New Tanglewood Tales, Life on Stage and Off, was provided in part by Cynthia and Ollie Kerm. To learn more about Tanglewood, the summer home of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, please visit www.tanglewood.org.